Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to introduce our mayor, Mayor Mike Duggan. All right, let's give them another hand. Weren't they great? Gives you a sense of the kind of talent we have in uh, building the future of our city. Uh, I get uh, the opportunity uh, now to introduce the man who brought us together, and uh, I hope uh, you're, you're enjoying your time. How many here are from out of town? All right, well, I, I hope you're enjoying the hospitality. Yesterday, uh, I uh, hosted Seattle Mayor uh, Jenny Durkin at the football game with the Lions playing the Seahawks, and we extended her more hospitality uh, than I would have liked. Uh, so, uh, uh, but we're hoping that you enjoy your, your stay. Uh, it is special for me to introduce Mike Bloomberg. He has been a partner in our recovery uh, from literally the week I started uh, in the job, and I went to see him in, in 2013, when I started, of course, the city was in bankruptcy, but the average Detroiter, that wasn't what they felt. What they knew were half the street lights in the city were out. They knew that when you called 911, sometimes it took as long as an hour for an ambulance to show up because there were only eight working ambulances. They knew that a third of all the buses were broken down in the terminals and the bus schedule was meaningless. They knew that we had 40,000 abandoned homes. And so I went and I saw Mike Bloomberg, who has these different programs, and he says, so what do you need from me the most? And I said, you know, I'm gonna hire people that are gonna get the buses to run. I'm gonna hire people uh, who will fix the ambulances and get them on the road. But even if we get all those services fixed, and it'll take a couple years to do that, that just brings us level to everybody else. And Detroit can't afford to just be level. I need to be able to think about what's next. So yes, we need to get the buses to fix, but what does a real transportation system look like? How do we get the traffic to move with coordinated lights? How do bike lanes fit in in mobility plans? I need somebody to actually help us design the transportation system, as we sent his great uh, transportation director, Jeanette Sadiqan in. I said, you know, we're gonna knock down these uh, thousands of houses a year, which we're doing, and we'll figure out how to do that. It's been a challenge, but we're making progress. But the interesting thing is, the city owns 5,000 houses that were foreclosed on, somebody's living in today. Now, if I could figure out a way for the people in those houses, most cases they were tenants right in their rent check, every month, the landlord didn't pay the taxes, got foreclosed on. If I could figure out a way that those folks could buy those houses, I wouldn't have to knock down the others. But we don't have the capacity to both fly the plane and design the new plane at the same time. He sent a team in that helped us design a plan we call buyback, where now somebody who's in the house can put $1,000 down, can set aside $100 a month for 12 months for taxes and go through a whole series of home ownership and financial planning courses and get title to the house. And we've now had hundreds of people buy houses and own them so that we didn't have to have more folks on the street. This was the advantage of having Mike Bloomberg's uh, team. And when you think about uh, how extraordinary it is, those of us who are here who are mayors know, when you're a mayor, you're focused on your job, and when you go, whether it's for higher office or private sector or the like, uh, you've, you've either succeeded or you haven't. And if you succeeded, people are saying, man, when so-and-so was the mayor, they did a good job. And, that, and that's your, your legacy. And anybody who's been to New York, and has gotten in a taxi cab, and you say, how are things going? Your cab driver invariably says, when Mayor Bloomberg was mayor, they were going really well. Uh, and so, so Mike Bloomberg could have gone off into retirement. And he looked at this and said, no major company in America would succeed if you turned over the CEO and management team every four to eight years on a random basis. The learning curve is too great. And he said, you know, I was better two years in and four years in than when I started, and so was my team. What if we took the expertise that we learned and we shared it with mayors and administrations, not just around the United States, but around the world? And that's what he set up between Bloomberg Associates and Bloomberg Philanthropies in at least a half a dozen areas. He has helped us design our recovery. We are two years ahead of where we would be if it wasn't 
for this mayor. And so while you all think of him as a New Yorker, I'd like you to welcome who, one who is now one of Detroit's favorite sons, Mayor Mike Bloomberg. That was a very nice introduction. Uh, some wags said my uh, father would, uh, my mother never would have believed it, and my father would have every word. Um, anyways, uh, Dan and David, thank you for co sponsoring this. The Atlantic and Aspen Institute are uh, the ones that really make this thing work, and Bloomberg Philanthropies is uh, happy to be partnering with them, and hopefully, we'll all make a difference. As we all know, people, 50% of them live in cities already, and it's going towards 70% in the next couple of decades. So cities are where the action is, cities are where culture is, cities are where uh, the problems are, and the solutions. And I think you could not have a better example of what you do when you inherit that than uh, Mike Duggan. Uh, he has done a phenomenal job, the city. He really is one of the best mayors in America. And also, uh, we need a round of applause one more time for the D Detroit Youth Choir. Now, I am not an expert when it comes to singers and musicians. Uh, no one has ever asked me to be a judge on America's Got Talent. But those kids really did have talent, and uh, they were great to come. Uh, ages were from like 6 to 16 and uh, some of them had been in this organization for half a dozen years already, others are new, but they come from all over the Detroit area, and uh, it gives them something to, uh, ways to express their pride in Detroit, and that's what we have to do in all our cities. I said earlier that mayors are salesmen. Uh, you have to sell businesses to come and stay in your city, you have to sell to residents to stay and new ones to come. Uh, you also have to be a manager, um, <clears throat> you have to be a leader, uh, nobody ever said a mayor's job is easy. Uh, we all know that everybody wants something and nobody wants to pay for it. Uh, that's just the real world. Um, let me, for a few seconds, talk about something much more serious and tragic. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Pittsburgh and uh, we were visiting with a, the mayor and a bunch of different community organizations, one of which is uh, Moms Against Guns. and. Um, it was, uh, it was really quite amazing, the enthusiasm they had and how they were so convinced that we were making progress, and we are, but then we know that 11 people were killed a few days ago, six were injured at the Tree of Life Synagogue, and our hearts really have to go out to all of them. And all the mayors know uh, when somebody gets killed, a police officer, a fire officer, a firefighter, or a uh, sanitation worker, and you have to go and look the families in the eye. It is never easy, particularly if you do a eulogy and you're talking to the parents and it's their child uh, in the casket. And uh, I don't think any of us can ever feel what they feel, and hopefully most of us never will have that experience. But um, we've just got to stop this carnage. And uh, um, it just, it, it, it's all over this country, and we're the only major country that has this gun problem. And nobody's trying to take away anybody's guns, but just common sense, and 90% of the people polled say that it is time to stop it, and we should have reasonable background checks and don't sell guns to minors, don't sell guns to people with psychiatric problems, don't sell guns to uh, people that have criminal records. And if you just did those th three things, which we're doing in 18 states already, uh, you really do make a difference. So we've just got to make sure that both parties understand that uh, we need solutions to gun violence and so many other issues. And uh, we're here at City Lab to solve some of those problems. We can't do it all on our own. Uh, guns is an issue where the mayors can do something, but it's state, real, state government, really, that has to pass laws because the federal government is just hopeless and doesn't seem to want to ever change. Uh, but we've... Uh, we just can't keep going on this way. Anyways, uh, I'm particularly happy to be here with our partners, and thank you for their support. This is the sixth annual City Lab, and we're particularly happy to be holding it in Detroit. Uh, back when we started the City Lab in, 19, in uh, 2013, Detroit had just filed the largest municipal bankruptcy in history. The city's economy was still struggling from the aftermath of the Great Recession. Real estate values had plummeted, 
poverty had soared and its population had continued to decline. But in the years since, under the leadership of the mayor, Detroit has come back. The economy is working again. The city is investing in a cleaner, healthy environment. And now people are moving to Detroit and not away from it. And Bloomberg Philanthropies has been glad to support Megan Duggan and his team on issues ranging from transportation to economic development to the earned income tax credit. Uh, because we do believe that cities like Detroit are the engines of global progress, and that's what City Lab is all about. Our foundation is investing more than ever before in local communities around the world, and we've been doubling down here in the United States, uh, because the truth is the more dysfunctional Washington gets, the more important local governments have become. And if you ever need a lesson in how to make a federal government dysfunctional, we've just watched the classic case. Um, but we've uh, started to uh, help this with through an American Cities Initiative, a $200 million investment in communities around the country. And part of that work, we brought the Mayor's Challenge back to, the ho back to home in the United States. And I'll be announcing this year's winners in a little bit. But first, I did want to talk to you about one of the most encouraging trends in our nation today. And that is a trend at the core of City Lab and the Mayor's Challenge. It is uh, uh, Washington still asleep at the, at the wheel. Cities are now driving the agenda across this country. Cities are leading the way on climate change. Cities are leading the way on gun balance, on public health, and so much more. And not just the big cities. Uh, today, cities and towns of all sizes have embraced the spirit of innovation, and they are leading in ways that Washington will not. I've been encouraged to see smart people pay attention to the work that's been happening in local governments, in communities, the big and small, red and blue. Uh, one of this year's most talked about books is Our Towns by James and Deborah Fallows. They traveled 100,000 miles and highlighted the work that's taking place in American towns. And my friend New York Times correspondent David Brooks recently called this kind of local bottoms up action a coming wave, not a red, red wave or a blue wave, but a coming wave. And uh, he'll be happy to know the wave we think is already here and it is getting bigger and it is getting stronger. If there's a silver lining to the chaos and division and inaction in Washington these days, it is that smart people inside the Beltway are turning their attention towards the rest of the country, where cities and towns are proving that progress is still possible. Uh, and part of that is because they are looking at the polls and saying, wait a second, I want to stay inside the Beltway. And there's a bunch of people that say they're going to send me home unless I do something. So all of a sudden, these issues are getting new attention. Take climate change. When the White House announced that its intention to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement, hundreds of cities and towns, along with businesses and universities and states, came together to declare, we're still in. And Governor Jerry Brown and I have brought them together and under one banner, and we call it America's Pledge. To put the size of our group in perspective, it represents more than half the population of the United States. If we were a country, we'd have the world's third largest economy. Together, we are determined to fulfill America's commitment under the Paris Agreement, no matter what happens in Washington. And the good news is, for example, when we're closing coal-fired power plants, we have been closing coal-fired power plants, which are the worst source of pollution in the country, at the same rate under Donald Trump that we did under Barack Obama. See, it just shows that the federal government really doesn't have a lot to do with that. It is the grassroots people who write letters to the power plant and the local commissions that pick it and go and try to explain to operators of coal-fired power plants that natural gas is better and renewables are getting there and it's time to do something and that we're getting action. So uh, America, is the only large industrial country in the world that is at the moment on target to meet its Paris 21, COP21 goals. And that is with some help from Donald Trump, because every time he says it's pseudoscience or something, the contributions keep rolling in. And I keep saying, Donald, do it again. Uh, we have a long ways to go, seriously, to address climate change, but the US recent, UN's recent report has made that abundantly clear. But I believe that we can do it, and just look at the data. Over the past 10 years, thanks to most, uh, mostly to actions by cities and businesses, the U.S. has cut its carbon emissions more than any other large nation. And the reason is simple. American people want cheaper energy, and they want cleaner air. And the marketplace is delivering. 
Now that doesn't mean we should let Washington off the hook, no ways, but it does show how local governments can get things done when Washington won't. Together, as trust in large institutions drops around the world and as central governments seem less and less accountable, I don't think there could be a better time for communities to reassert their rightful role as leaders in innovative government, in scientific discovery, in technological advancement, and in economic progress. Because on practically every issue matters local, uh, every issues that matter, local communities are charting the way forward. And they're proving that democracy in the 21st century can still work for all the people. And that's the promise of the mayor's challenge, that if we give communities a boost, they will be able to implement bold ideas and tackle big problems. When you think about it, so many of the systems we rely on today are designed to address the challenges of the last century. Today, challenges are different, and they require different solutions. Think back to uh, what we did a long time ago, and we've got to start making adjustments. The solutions of the past are not the solutions that we need today, and that's why I was so thrilled at the incredible level of participation in this year's Mayor's Challenge. We received 324 applications, and after narrowing the field down to 35 finalists, a jury determined nine winners. I was not on the selection committee. I just didn't be, don't like the results. Don't call me. Uh, seriously, we had a wonderful group of people who really know what they're doing, who went and devoted a lot of time to uh, winnowing it down and then picking the final ones. These communities that have won have come up with exceptional ideas that will move us forward on some of the most pressing issues we face. And one of the great things about this challenge is that some of the things that the people who were in the final 35 but didn't win or didn't even make the 35, they have ideas and there are cities around the country that might want to copy those ideas. And that was one of the criteria in being selected as a winner. Your idea had to be useful for others and you had to make sure that they could copy it because we're not here just to help our own cities, we're here to help the whole country and really the whole world. So uh, let's get to announcing the winners, and to assist me, please welcome Shael from the Detroit Youth Choir. Shael. If they don't take a picture, it never happened. That's what you gotta learn. Uh, are you ready? Okay, well, don't be nervous. Only hundreds of the most important people in the world are watching you at this very moment. So just, you know, they would, have, they would rather be up here and you there, so you beat them all out. Anyways, um, now in no particular order, here are the winners of the 2018 Mayor's Challenge. The first winner is... Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Los Angeles, California, they have come up with the ways to develop, uh, house people who are homeless in a new fashion. Next winner is? Denver. Denver, Colorado. <laughs> Denver, Colorado will improve air quality by installing air pollution sensors around schools 60 miles north of Denver. Next. Fort Collins. Fort Collins will make housing safer and more energy efficient for low-income renters. The next winner is... Georgetown. Down in Texas, Georgetown is working to be the first energy self-sufficient city in the country. And I might point out they have a Republican mayor, so there's nothing blue or red about it. He's just done a great job. And it is from a state that sent somebody to Washington who wasn't exactly a great fan of addressing climate change as a problem. Nevertheless, Texas, I think, is the leading state in both wind and solar at the moment. So don't listen to what some of these idiots say. Just look at what they do on the ground. And this mayor's done a great job. The next winner. Philadelphia. The city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania.
Philadelphia will provide services to young people who are arrested rather than sending them to local police precincts. Next. South Bend. South Bend. South Bend, Indiana is home to a certain college football team that I will not mention here in Michigan. Uh, they're going to work with the ride-sharing companies to help low-income and part-time workers get to their jobs. And transportation is also the focus of our next winner, who it is? Durham. Durham, North Carolina. Durham, North Carolina will use data-driven methods to incentivize drivers to get out of their cars and into buses. Next. Huntington. Isn't Shiel doing a great job? Maybe I should take her on the road with me. Would you like to go camping? She's right. Huntington, West Virginia is our next winner, and they'll combat the opioid crisis by placing mental health professionals in emergency response departments. Departments, And not too far from my hometown, our final winner is... New Rochelle. The city of New Rochelle, New York will use virtual reality technology to improve how communities, how, how they communicate with citizens. Uh, great job, Shale. You want to say goodbye to everybody? Bye. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to uh, City Labs, and congratulations to all our winners. I look forward to seeing how each of your projects work out and hopefully how they change lives and spread the cities across the America and around the world. You should know that Bloomberg Philanthropies not only tries to provide funding, but a lot of technical expertise, and we have a commitment to follow each one of these programs and make sure they actually do what they said and make sure people know about it, because we think they're all going to work. So uh, all the best. One more round of applause for the... 28 days.